All right, now now we're recording. Now it's now it's real. Now it's real. I bring my A game, right? Okay. Perfect storm. Um, I just want to thank you so much for coming out tonight. For those of you that are virtual, thanks for making time to be here tonight. Uh, it means a lot to me. Natalie, thanks for coming out. Hi. Megan, Natalie's, <laughs> Natalie just talked to you. Megan's right there. Megan just left. Okay, sorry. No, she's back. All right. We're going to just jump right in. We, we have really three goals tonight, and they're right here on this. Is that many of you have been walking through this storm. If you caught the uh, um, Facebook Live I did yesterday, I just talked about how for most of you, your life is not easy. There is no easy transitions. There's no easy, it was not easy going to school. It was not easy going to work. It's not easy for these kids. It's not easy for you as an adult. Everything takes longer. It's harder. You have to compensate. And as a parent, you're trying to figure out how to help your kid compensate. So we got three things that I really want to bring to you tonight. And that is hope, answers, and help. Okay. Uh, we're going to have a really good time tonight. And if you were live, it'd be even more fun. So Megan gets all the fun tonight. So hopefully I'm really hyping this up. So she's like, she's like, you better deliver on this, buddy. Um, so as long as the wine's flowing, I think we'll be okay. All right. A good friend of mine does this as a dinner talk. And he says they have to be careful about the number of drinks they provide before the talk because we had a couple people that actually, you know, didn't make it through the talk. So anyways, I love that. All right. Um, we're going to dive right in. So let me just take you into our story. This is my motivation. This is why I do what I do. These people have not only changed me and made me the dad that I am, the person I am, but this is what we do this for. And you're here on this call or here live with us because it affects you or it affects your family. And they're the number of things that you've lost or walked through or the challenge you're facing are overwhelming at times. But I just want to tell you that this is my family. This is who I do this for. Um, every day as a pediatric and family chiropractor, my whole job is to change families' lives. Because I saw how chiropractic changed my life, how it changed my family's life, how it continues to change our life. And I love that we can do this naturally to help our family thrive and be successful. We live in a modern day era where there's so much stress. Even just waking up for most of us is stressful. Uh, where we're going to live, what we're going to eat, how we're going to get through the day. Cost of living is just exploding right now. And I know as a parent and as a young individual, uh, I used to be, believe it or not. I, there was a time. Yes, I, there was a time. Um, some of you can't even remember that, right? It's just been so far. <laughs> Anyways, I just want to share with you that they were the reason why I became a chiropractor. Um, we've had the privilege of serving the uh, McKinney community over the last three years. And it's just been a huge privilege to be a part of this. We're going to talk stories tonight. I want to share a couple of great stories, but I want to really bring you into this story that really started this whole process. This beautiful girl you see right up here is the reason why I really became a chiropractor. Because when she was born, and we're one of those weird families, uh, before I was in a chiropractor, we decided to have a home birth, and everything went as scheduled. It was perfect. Uh, we had the world's shortest pregnancy that we joke about because we found out that my wife was pregnant four and a half months in. We just were not very quick. We just couldn't figure it out. <laughs> uh, you know, Corey asked me, am I gaining weight? And what am I going to answer? No. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I was a young guy. I had no idea. She looked great to me. I was like, no. Anyways, so McKenna was born and there was something off and we weren't sure what it is uh, right away. And then our midwife put her finger right on it and said, she's not breathing. And we watched her color go from pink to blue as she was not getting enough oxygen. She had an infection in her lungs, in utero. There was nothing we did wrong, nothing that could have been done to change that. But this process that this midwife did this entire time was to try and give her everything she could to maximize and help her breathe. She pulled me aside and said, Matt, I've done everything that I can do, everything that I've been trained for. We need to transport you. And that was the last thing we wanted to do. We didn't want to be at the hospital. We wanted to be at home. We wanted to have this wonderful, perfect birth experience where it was just us hanging out, um, you know, with our midwife and her 14 assistants. No, it wasn't that bad. Uh, but it changed. And she said, is there anything you want to do before I call in? I says, well, I know a friend who's a chiropractor, and I'd love to see if that would help in any way, shape, or form. Well, I called Dr. Gary and Dr. Gary was out of town. And then uh, I called Dr. Matt and he was out of town. And I, I called another friend of mine who was a, a chiropractor. I, so I had a lot of friends who were chiropractors before I was even a chiropractor, which is kind of funny. And 
out of the blue, a young guy who is, you know, a, a newer chiropractor who just moved to San Diego, didn't know me from anybody, came to our house, showed up based on a text from a friend of a friend to come help a baby who was struggling. I'm going to try not to cry here. So if you're on video and I start crying, it's okay. Uh, but this doc came in, he assessed what was going on with my blue baby girl, and he gave her an adjustment right up at C1. He did one adjustment, one massive adjustment. And I watched her whole body go from blue to pink. And it was the most incredible experience I've ever seen in my life. Now she still struggled with breathing. She still was, uh, but her lights came back on. She was starting to respond better. We still needed to transport. And because of that moment, I will never forget how powerful the nervous system is. So we're going to hear some stories and hear about Jacob tonight. Get to hear about Gabe. Um, and it's just, it's really good. So, uh, but I want you to see that little girl right now was there. Now she's up here. She is just absolutely beautiful. Uh, for those who are online, that was McKenna when she was just a little blue eyed girl in the pink outfit when I could get her to wear dresses, not anymore. Um, and now this is her uh, when she was 14. Now she's chasing 16. So it's incredible to watch her thrive. So it's just a privilege for me to share with you that I've had this experience even before I was a chiropractor to know that perfect storm that was going on for my daughter right from the get go was under that stress. Uh, you know, she didn't even know, we didn't even know we were pregnant. Uh, all these different stressors that were going on for us, even before she was born, uh, that made her a little more vulnerable up front. So. Okay. I'm trying. All right. Uh, hopefully this video will come through for you. You'll be able to see this, uh, but we're going to jump right in to talk about what the perfect storm is uh, in just a second. We'll take a look at this video. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? This is the line that I want you to catch, that it's, it's easy to miss something you're not looking for. And as we begin this journey into what is the perfect storm and what you may have walked through or what your kiddo is walking through, or your family's walking through, we're going to be opening our eyes so we don't miss it. Because so many times we miss those things that seem, um, they seem very common, but they're not normal. And we want to look at those things to see how they are affecting us or affecting you or your kiddo. So also my keyboard's not working. So what is the perfect storm? And for many kids, the perfect storm begins before they're ever born. Um, it begins with fertility issues with mom and dad. It begins with the stress of even wanting to get pregnant, or maybe it was later in your life that you wanted to get pregnant and you were struggling with fertility, uh, it can also be pregnancy stress. Uh, our assistant just shared her story this morning with me about how stressed they were during the pregnancy, how it led to an emergency safe section, how many crazy things were going on with them. And as I talked to her about the perfect storm this morning, all these lights were going in and she's like, I've got to bring Zoe in tomorrow. Like we weren't scheduled to have Zoe come in till next week. Zoe's coming in tomorrow because she knows that that stress is affecting her kiddo. And one of the first things she said, she was super colicky. Could that be because of what she went through in utero? And I said, yes. So we're going to talk more about that. But this perfect storm begins for so many families, even before that baby's born. And if we look back at your history, there's a good chance there may have been some stress in there that you weren't aware of as a kid. I know, call your mom. <clears throat> it's very common. I see the text come out all the time during the perfect storm asking mom, but I go through stress. Were you and dad doing okay during this time? What was happening? 
Um, so, but this storm starts to brew. And if you've ever been a part of a, I, we were just down in Florida and got to see a storm roll in, they come in fast and you don't always expect them to be there. Uh, and for many of us, when we were new parents or wanting to be a parent or trying to get pregnant, uh, for us, we were surprised pregnant. We weren't planning on getting pregnant. Um, you know, uh, we were early in our marriage and all of a sudden we were pregnant and we were like, whoa, that, you know, we were planning to go to Spain and Europe and that didn't happen. <laughs> we had a baby. So now many times those fertility issues and pregnancy issues lead to a stressful pregnancy leads to, it doesn't always, so please hear me in this. This is not always, this is majority of the time, but it does happen that then when there's a stressful pregnancy, it can lead to a stressful delivery. And nowadays, we live in a world where birth is unfortunately more of a procedure than a true process that is designed. God designed women perfectly to be able to deliver these babies as they are. It is, we've created so many extra hoops you get to jump through. I know it's scary as all of you, but then there's people have been delivering babies for thousands of years on their own with help uh, from other women. Uh, but now we deal with medical interventions at labor more and more. It is so common for us and our intake to have a family come in and say, yeah, there was a vacuum extraction or there's a C-section or there's forceps use. Um, but that medical intervention at labor and delivery begins this process. It creates stress. There's nothing calming about that. Um, and then the mom is told what's going on and that creates more stress. And so everybody's under this state of stress. And we're going to look at how that affects the body overall. So you see how the storm starts brewing. If this is that case for this poor kid that's going through this, or this is your kid that went through this, after that medical intervention and this crazy delivery, all of a sudden these other things started showing up when they were little. You start seeing the ear infections. You start seeing the colic right away or the, uh, the reflux or not latching. You start seeing them only be able to turn one way. And a colicky baby, if you've ever walked through that, which we have, how long has Kempton Colicky was at least six weeks, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. And, and we were a chiropractic family, and we just kind of blanked out on the fact that going to get Kempton adjusted on a really regular basis um, to get his nervous system back online. But he cried almost every day, all day, for the better part of six weeks. It drives you insane. I mean, I remember how exhausted we were. We were looking for everything we could to help that kiddo get through that, right? Um, but a stressed, colicky baby many times leads to a stressed, consistently sick, the ear infection, the reoccurring cold, the, the asthma, or challenges as a toddler. Sometimes we even see that lack of coordination or an underdeveloped muscle tone or inability to start speaking on schedule. Um, all of these stressors start to play into this. And you start seeing this storm. And I love that Tony, one of my mentors who put together the perfect storm, it uses a tornado because it starts to build. It starts to build. We live in Kansas and I've seen them up close. Yes, in Kansas, Dorothy. Yes, they're real. They come out there. There's more in Oklahoma, by the way, but that's better. That the storm is building and brewing and it gets stronger and stronger. But so many times, what are we told by the pediatrician? What are we told by our doctor? They'll grow out of it. Well, we don't see that happening. We see kids grow into it. They grow into that stress they've been through or you grew into that stress you've been through. Um, Megan just shared with me that she's just been diagnosed at 29. And that's a long road to be there and feeling like, I don't know what's wrong. What, why, why can't I pull these things together? Or having people tell you, figure it out, right? I mean, what's some of the junk you've been told? I mean, you've probably been told all kinds of stuff. Get over it, especially at this point. Get over it, yeah. Um, those of you online, I know you've been probably told some things too, like they'll just grow out of it. And you're like, and you, I want to say this up front for any female or mom there, trust your gut. God has put inside of you this sixth sense, this, this ability to sense when things are off or wrong. Please trust that. Please trust that. So if you're sensing there's something off of your kiddo, there probably is. And it many times has to do with the storm that's been building, Okay. This is not always the case, but so many times that stress, consistently sick, challenging, taller, starts to develop sensory spectrum or what we call become stuck. They start getting stuck as they head in those early years of seven, eight, nine, school age and older. They start moving in this age where they're, they, they, they don't like the clothes they're wearing or they can't sit still or they're what we call a raging bull where they're running around in circles in the classroom. They got to touch everything where they can only wear red uh, or their shoes are too tight. 
uh, or they just they check out all the time and they can't interact or, or, or engage with other people. The storm is brewing. Which leads to many times, and I'm walking with one right now, we have this beautiful girl named Kaya who came into us and she was just exhausted. She was angry and anxious because of all the stuff she was walking through. She had sensory overload all the time. She would hear the ticking of the clock. It becomes so loud in her ears that she couldn't handle it. She had to put on black glasses and drown music out to try and get that sound out. And she could still hear the clock. And it's been a privilege to walk with her. Which then so many times we walk through that anxiousness leads to this depression. They're worried about what's going to happen and where they're at or how they're going to fit in and how do I get connected? And then they just, and then they're told they're just to grow out of it or, or take some medication and you'll be okay. And we're just going to fix this. But you know in your heart and your mind that it's not being fixed. There's a storm that continues to breathe. And unfortunately, if you stay on this path of the storm, we run into this burnout, stressed out, anxious, ADHD adults who struggle with jobs, struggle in their roles and have to work overly hard to compensate, to be able to do the same thing that everybody else is doing. And they know in their mind, if they could just calm this noise and this movement that's running by, I describe it like you're looking outside of the car as a train's going by and you're going one way and it's going the other way and everything's moving so fast and you're desperate to reach out and grab and have it slow down. So if you walk away with anything tonight, I want to give you a term that we're going to talk about and bring back in. You'll understand where we're about. We're neurologically focused. We're talking about the brain tonight, how the brain works and what we can do about that. But here's the thing. When we lead to this, what is subluxation? What are we dealing with overall is stress stuck on. A perfect storm essentially is this stress stuck on. Chemical, physical, emotional stress. Any one of those can put us and our nervous system over the top. So our idea is to talk about this idea of brake and gas. How does that work? Okay, we're going to walk through that tonight, understanding what that gas pedal is, uh, where the nervous system and how it works. There's two parts of the nervous system, okay? So when stress is stuck on, it creates like the gas pedals all the way down. If you've driven or drive, okay, or taught someone to drive, you understand that the gas pedal, when it's all the way down without any brake, it leads to an accident. You crash. If you have too much brake pedal on, you don't go anywhere. And the fun one is, is I get the brake pedal on and the gas pedal all the way down. You're definitely not going anywhere and you're going trying to do it really fast. So many times that's what's going on at the heart and soul of what's behind the perfect storm is just this. Those traumas, those toxins, those thoughts, how they play into how our kiddos are struggling or how you are struggling. And we want to look at that idea of that, that fight or flight is that gas pedal, okay? And that rest and digest is the brake pedal. And we don't want too much of either one. We want a good balance. We want to be able to react when we need to react, but we all also want to be able to put the brakes on when we need to slow down. Bruce Lipton says an amazing quote here at the bottom. It says that you can't be in growth and protection at the same time. And when you see that you're in that protection mode where the guard is up, where the mind is racing, you can't slow down, your kid can't focus, they can't engage, they're in that protection mode. And the longer we stay there, and the younger this happens to us, the greater effect it has. So what is this perfect storm? Apparently, I have a double slide just so you guys could really get it ground into your heads. All right, good. All right, Bruce Lipton said this, the function of the nervous system, which is that, it's the brain and the spine are one unit, right? They control everything. The function of the nervous system is to perceive the environment and coordinate the behavior. So perceive, understand what's going on around us and then coordinate the behavior, okay? So if that is getting too much information or not enough information, it affects how everything is coordinated, right? You're living that out. You know that firsthand. Moms, dads, uh, both of you on, all you online, sorry, I shut down who's all online. So, um, it, you're walking through this understanding that the function of this nervous system is perceive and coordinate the behavior of all other cells. So here's where we're going to go with that. If there's altered perception, if your perception is altered, right? If the information you're getting in 
begins early, it's going to relate to altered function. The very first thing we see with kids who have that stress on them in any shape or form during those early years specifically, we see it develop first in that motor because that's the first part of our body that develops, right? You start arching, you start lifting. If you have a little one, you remember how wiggly they are? Everything is muscle. If you were that wiggly one that your mom reminds you about and you were all over the place, that motor system is what develops first. But if you have altered perception, what we say subluxation, or if there's stress in the system, right, it leads to altered function. Because here's something, if you write anything down outside of subluxation, each stretch, stress, this is it. Our brains are built from the bottom up, back, forward. So as they develop, right from the get-go, the brain is developed from the bottom up. So we have the amygdala, the cerebellum, all these places that coordinate all the way up. The last part of the brain to develop is that prefrontal cortex. So we joke when someone says, you know, they don't know what they're doing and they're under 25. They don't because their brain is not fully developed. Uh, you know, I'm chasing 49 and uh, sometimes I question whether that's fully developed yet or not. But that altered perception affects motor first. Then it affects the gut. Then we start seeing a gut that's not functioning well starts to affect the immune. And then we start seeing speech problems or lack of development of speech. And then when we get into school, we start seeing that social or behavioral or emotional, all of these things play in. And this is where we get that altered state of function. So this is from Harvard's site. It's called Harvard, Harvard's Developing uh, Child. This is a discussion from their site. And they talk about when their stress in the system, it says this, the interaction of genes and experiences shape the developing brain. The interaction of genes and experiences shapes the developing brain. So whatever our genes interact with, if they're under stress, it develops, it affects the developing brain. Though our genes provide the blueprint for formation of our brain circuits, these circuits are reinforced by repeated use. So the more we do something, nerves that fire together, wire together. So our brain, when it gets in a stress state, is going to stay in a stress state. Yes, yes. And then it affects these areas. You start seeing cognitive, emotional, and social capacities are inextricably intertwined throughout the course of life. So when we have this toxic stress, it weakens the very architecture or how the, how the neurons work together in the developing brain, which then leads to a lifelong behavior, physical, and mental challenges. This is why we see ADHD, AD, sensory and autism exploding like never before, because we have so much stress so early on our kids that the very makeup of their body, their very genes are being reshaped so they have a shorter fuse. They're not able to process the information. It blows my mind that our body is designed this way that it is affected by those things and knowing what we know now, what could we have done? So that altered perception, altered function. Apparently you can't go backwards. All right. So here's that reminded part of how the human brain development takes place. And all of this is happening within the first year, okay? So within that first year, the very first things that develop exponentially, look what happens even before we're born. The first things, the higher cognition is already starting to come on, language is starting to come on board, but here's what shoots off the charts. Sensory pathways, hearing and vision are the ones that are first developed here. And we see this in our office. If there's been stress on that nervous system, there's any kind of intervention at birth, we usually see a decrease in the tone of the muscles and we see a decrease in the language ability to develop. The neural connections and the functions, you start seeing that within this first year, look what's all that's taking place. So if there's any kind of challenges during that first year and there's anything that happens before they're ever born, this is what it looks like. This is how the brain's architecture is. Like. So this is that you see on the screen there. What this is, this is a computer map of a neuron, a dendrite, what they look like. And when they are put under toxic stress, that's what they look like. See how there's so many less connections. Look at the distance. Are the dendrites, are those little legs that are all supposed to be interacting. And that's what communicates from one thing to another in our brain like that. So if you've been under a lot of toxic stress or been under that, you have less. And so when you're wanting a thought or grabbing a thought, 
It's not connecting. Yes, I am so glad you're here, Megan. This is awesome. Well, you can <laughs> see that a damage damage neuro has fewer connections. Okay. So here's this algorithm that we walk through when we talk about this. If you're wanting to know how this affects your kids. So the first thing that I ask when I'm walking through this process, I'm going to do an intake to get to know you, to help understand what's happening is how much stress have you been under? So how much was there intervention? Was there early stress? Was there physical stress? Was there chemical stress? You know, how many antibiotics and rounds have you been through? What are the treatments have you been on? What are you taking now? I had a young man coming in the day who was on 14 medications. Lots of chemical stress. How much stress has been on the system? Okay, then the next big question we ask is when did it occur? So the earlier it happens, if it happens pre-birth or during birth or in those first year, uh, that stress is exponential because what's happening during that time? The brain is on this crazy roller coaster of development and the brain controls everything. And if it's under stress, then everything else it produces is under stress. So then the next part of this is once we know how long, when that stress occurred, then we can equal how much care and for how long to help. So the sooner we've been under stress, the longer it takes to get that unwound because it's built right into our very architecture. Okay. So um, I love this. This is the neural fuse box. When you come into our office, you get to see this at live and cross, but this is a great quote. It talks about the neurofinal spinal system. And that is the spine serves as far more than a bunch of ligaments and bones. It's a living, breathing neurological communication superhighway that is vitally important in brain to body and back again, catch that back again, brain to body, body to brain, communication, coordination, and control of every other tissue, cell, and system of the body. Every system of our body is controlled by that nervous system. And it acts just like a fuse box. And if there's too much stress in one area, a fuse pops. It's designed to protect us. Our body is technically protecting us. But then once that fuse pops, it doesn't have a way to turn it back on unless it gets some help. So here's that key we talked about before. Those of you that are writing down notes feverishly, which like Megan is here, you guys got to keep up with her. She's like, uh, her wrist is actually hurting. She actually is coming back to us for carpal tunnel now. Um, subluxation is a term that we use in chiropractic, and it essentially means this. It's a condition of stress stuck on. So when you look at what we do as a chiropractor, we're, we're looking for and assessing and trying to help understand the subluxation complex to see what's going on with the system and how that stress has been stuck on and in your system. So now we're gonna dig deep into the science. So we heard a little bit of the story. We got a little bit of background of what it is. Now let's dive right in. So the first thing that we're gonna look for in understanding of what causes this perfect storm is this. When we talk about any interventions or things that take place is the idea of dyskinesia. Dyskinesia, which means misalignment and or fixation. So when something is misaligned, it usually is not working. If you've ever had a misaligned tire on your car uh, or something is not installed right on your car, you hear it, right? And if something is really stuck, you can't get it on stuck. That's what fixation is. So the first thing that we're looking for is when we have these traumatic things take place, the body responds to and with trauma or stress with dyskinesia. So if nothing's done to relieve that, it stays there. Anybody broken their arm? Raise your hand. Okay, good. We have someone in the audience who's broken their arm. <laughs> Anyways, did, did, when you went to the hospital, did they heal your arm? Or you had a friend whose arm was broken? Yes. No, they didn't. What they did is they said it, they took that misalignment and they put it back as it needed to be. And the body did the work. It's designed to be self-healing and self-regulating. But when there is dyskinesia in the nervous system, when there is a fixation, in the physical structure of our body, over time, it stays that way. I'm actually more worried about a fixation than I am about a misalignment. If something's stuck, I can put something back in a line, but if something's stuck, that means we got to break that up and get that moving again. So I want to show you where that dyskinesia may have began. This is a little bit graphic. Uh, this is called the whistle while you work. So uh, we're going to take a look here, and uh, we'll, we'll go from here. It's irritated. 
So we, we jump right into this. I'm showing you the C section, uh, and you see right through this is a textbook C section. They did a beautiful job. The, 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 this in obstetrics would be a great training video because they did it exactly how they are trained to do it. And you can see right to the get go, they take that head, they put about 60 pounds of force on that head, pulling directly up. They pull it all the way over to one side, then they rip that shoulder back up and out to clear that shoulder out, all the way back over the other side, and then they lift directly straight up and out. So tell me right from the get go that that won't have effect on and lead to that dyskinesia, a lack of movement. So that's why you see so many kiddos that run into or have that torticollis or no longer have that movement that they need or leads to a tongue tie. Um, th there's nothing wrong with a C-section. It's designed to be an emergency procedure when it's needed. But so many times it becomes the only option that takes place. And there's nothing done. If that nervous system or if that baby is affected that way, we desperately hope that there's something can be done immediately after that. But they're not trained that way. They're trained to save that baby, get them out, be done, and whistle while they work. I mean, they, these guys are relaxed, doing what they need to do. Uh, but no one's taking account how that's affecting the baby. When the baby is born vaginally, it's designed to go through this process that starts the nervous system. That whole squeeze and release that takes place in the uterus that whole pathway down the vaginal canal, all of that is designed to stimulate every aspect of that baby's nervous system. So when that doesn't happen, they get short circuit. They don't get the full squeeze. They don't get everything they need. And that's why 90% of the kids that walk through our office were C-sections. They, they got, a lot got skipped. They don't have a lot going on. Um, and so we wanna do everything we can to help get that back in place. It's easy to miss something you're not looking for. And that's why I wanted to stop here for a second. You can see the amount of force, the amount of torque that's taking place on that brand new nervous system. And this is considered normal. It's common, it's just not normal. So if they're not trained to look for how it affects the nervous system, unless the brain and the spine working together, then hey, this is just gonna be a typical thing. This is a good thing. And it's just seen as okay. Um, and we want to be able to help this little one because he's already going through some trauma, obviously. He's got some interventions taking place. He's going to need some help. And what's taking place right there is over 60 pounds of force directly on that brainstem, which controls and coordinates the cerebellum, which then affects the amygdala, what affects the hippocampus, which affects the prefrontal cortex. All this is developing. And if that's under stress, nothing works the way it is. It's like taking spaghetti and throwing it against the wall and hoping to create art. Now, if you like Jackson Pollock, I understand different, not the same. Okay. This chart just shows what took place from 1970 to 2012. The number of C-sections that took place was 6% of all births in 1970 were C-section compared to where we are in 2012. And I should get an updated version of this, obviously, is this. It's 33% of all births. So we see an increase of this taking place. So imagine if it continues to do a slight dip here and follows the same curve, we're probably over 50% of all births now are C-sections. So we have all these kiddos that are not getting naturally what was designed for them, which then puts a huge impact and stress on their system right from the get-go. Please hear me. There is a time and place where these save kiddos' lives, save moms' lives, but there's a lot of times that it's just become a procedure and an easy way to go instead of what's best for the kiddo. I hope I haven't lost anybody out there. Okay, uh, so research, we'll jump through this pretty quick, but basically this was done by uh, a group of DOs and they're looking at somatic or what means uh, nervous system or function of the, uh, the vertebrae uh, at birth. And they did this at 99 per, out of 100 had at least a pattern of subluxation. And that is, that they determined that is a lack of movement uh, or fixation, like we talked about dyskinesia. Now, just from normal birth, let alone going through a traumatic birth, more references, we'd be glad to send you if anybody wants them. Just DM me on Facebook and I will be glad to send those to you. And we're going to go back to go forward, apparently. There we go. Which leads to our next D. Okay. So our next D is disaffrontation, which is really abnormal 
neural input or sensory. We get too much of this. When we have too much disaffrontation, we have this abnormal input. So too much energy, disaffrontation. How am I processing the information? So once we have dyskinesia, then it leads to this disaffrontation where I no longer can handle the inputs that are coming in. So if you walk through sensory, or you know of someone who has, or your kid is walking through that, or you're desperate, you're no longer seeing those medications work the way they used to, we're here and we're stuck in that area of disaffrontation. So I wanna help you see this with another video that helps us really decide and understand how disaffrontation shows out. And this is when we talk about sensory processing disorder. There's three things that are taking place here. We're looking at how perception happens, coordination, which then leads to how we sense, how we handle those inputs. Some kids are really bouncy and can't sit still. Some kids aren't very coordinated. Some see food as a pile of toxic goo that hurts their mouth and jangles their taste buds. School might be a mysterious place where things don't make much sense. If this sounds like you, you may have sensory processing disorder, and we're going to explain it here. Your body has seven senses, vision in your eyes, hearing in your ears, touch in your skin, taste in your mouth and smell in your nose. And you have two movement senses, your muscles and your sense of balance. In sensory processing disorder, these senses don't communicate right with your brain. Think of the nerves connecting your brain and senses as a set of roads. Those roads should be smooth superhighways so that the senses and brain can communicate fast. If you have sensory processing disorder, then some of your roads are bumpy and rough. You can also think of the senses as having a broken volume control. If the volume is too high, you will feel your senses too strongly. If the volume is too low, you won't feel sensation at all. In fact, you'll want more. Some kids overcome these problems as they grow older. Others need help. Help is usually occupational therapy and it's fun. Occupational therapy helps build up the connections between your senses and your brain. The more you do, the stronger and smoother they get, kind of like paving those roads. After a while, you'll learn to slow down and sit still. To pay attention. To eat, to be comfortable and happy doing movement. It takes time. There's homework too. The better it gets. So I love this video because it really, if you saw the whole thing and you catch one part of that, you see how disaffrontation causes the overload of that system. And they explain that really well. Either something is too much or too little. That's that idea of gas and brake that we're going to dive into here in a little bit. When there's too much gas pedal down, then every sensory issue is overloaded. When there's too much brake pedal, they can't engage. They can't shut things off. They don't have that sense that they're full. So they're going to eat more and more and more and more. We had a young man who lived in our neighborhood who had disaffrontation so bad that he would literally have, they'd have to lock the fridge and the cabinets because he would eat everything. In fact, they forgot one night to put away the dog food and he sat till he made himself sick eating dog food um, because that was what was available and he had no way to control or know what was going on from his So perception, how we perceive, which is coming from our brain and our spine running together, dictates the coordination which then affects how we sense and feel and interact with our information. So proprioception, so that's what we're gonna talk right on now, is this is perception of movement. And movement's the very first thing that develops for us as families, as kids, as a baby, that's the very first thing. So the significant percentage of movement stimulation or proprioception to the brain is a nutrient to the developing brain. And it comes from the spine, especially the neck. So if there's a fixation right there from the get-go of what we saw in that, unfortunately, in that C-section, we're seeing a direct impact to the nervous system as a whole. Does this make sense? Yeah, I wish we could like, see you online. You're nodding your heads right now. Okay, good. All right, good. Um, 
The other part of proprioception is nociception, and this is the body's ability to perceive and understand stress. So nociception is the sensory nervous systems, okay, response to certain harmful or potential harmful stimuli, both mechanical, chemical, or thermal. So when pain comes into our body, this is where we get pain. We know this. This is where noise comes in. So when you touch something hot, what do you do? You pull back. That is no C-section coming in your body. That is not good stuff. I don't like that. That is not good. You pull away. Okay. It's the same thing chemically when you get stung. Something hits you. They introduce something that doesn't fit good with your body. That's a chemical. It hurts. Your body reacts. It creates unless that pain you know that there's a problem right there. And when you do something about it. And thermal. This is that whole idea of when our body gets that fever, it's creating a thermal environment to take care of that bacteria or that virus that's in the system. This all leads to when that nociception is taking place is that gate theory, those gates that open and close within our body that give us an understanding of how we perceive things. So if there's decreased proprioception or lack of movement, right, opens the gate to let excessive nociception or noise in instead. So how we perceive and see and what does that is our nervous system, which is made of our brain and our spine, especially our neck and our back. All right, so disaffrontation, once again, that enamel and belly of the sensory input coming in and how that affects the amygdala, okay? So the amygdala, I want to show you right there, if you can see it online, it is the uh, purple dot right in the middle. If you're at the very bottom, you go yellow, light blue, pink, and then you see the purple. This is linked to emotion, okay? So this is the emotional seat of the brain and is in control of survival. We're taking in 11 million bits of information per second, per second. I like that I get to do these twice right now, it's really fun. Uh, there it is. Okay. Uh, it's just math again. It says there, if everything is coming in early and often is in flight or flight. So we've already talked about it. That brain is already in fight or flight. And then amygdala, which is the emotional state of the body, goes into survival mode. And then everything else is going to be hardwired that way. So if you're writing down anything, I got another one for you. Nerves that fire together will wire together. So pathways, just like in the previous video, are all bumpy, they're going to stay bumpy unless something gets in there to help get them back on track. But you become sensitized to that. So then we start living out that amygdala, your kid that's struggling with ADHD, ADD, or sensory issues, the majority of the time is living out of an emotional response. They can't guide themselves. They're responding purely out of survival of what they think and feel. And that hyperactivity of the amygdala is associated directly with fear and anxiety disorders. So psychiatrists and neurologists are working diligently right now chemically to figure out solutions. As chiropractors, we're trying to, we know exactly what we can do to help that nervous system calm down, to help with that amygdala to rest because it needs to be put back into a place of rest and digest. So the disaffrontation or that amount of a sensory input or excessive amount of input into that um, as I said, when we aren't getting the information in the hippocampus, this is important for converting those short-term memories into long-term memories. So if you've ever seen your kid not be able to connect or your short-term memories never made it to long-term, this is what's happening. Your core functional learning is not taking place. So imagine you're a kid in a classroom and you can't take that stuff you just heard and put it into something that you need to use later on in the day, then what do you come across as? Yeah, stupid or not interested, or you checked out. Say again? Not paying attention, not paying attention right? Because that hippocampus is working overtime. It's, it's hyperactive. It's not taking the short to long term. It also plays a role in spatial memory. So that's why you say social awareness. So if you see kids that are on the spectrum, they're really struggling to understand how to interact, or you see kids that are high with ADHD, ADD, they don't really understand the situation that's going on around them, or maybe that's you. Uh, they can't navigate their environment or their responses. So then we'll see a huge behavior outburst or we'll see a huge disengagement. And you can see both happen in the same minute, same hour, same day. So this works in concert with the amygdala to consolidate those emotions. So if this isn't working and the emotions are coming in all out of control and memories aren't being able to process, then they can't determine what's perception and how to coordinate things. 
and then appropriately and for the situation so that we have a survival response that's going through the hippocampus and says, yeah, just kind of do what you want to do, man. Let's just live that out because I can't convert the information. So start understanding and get to see a real clear picture of what's going on in your kiddo's brain or in your own brain. And then we just talk about the prefrontal cortex here. This is the input that's coming in the cerebellum dictates where information goes. So the cerebellum is right here. It's the very back. So that's what we talked about, back forward. This is one of the first parts of our body and our brain to develop. This is one of the last. But this coordinates all that voluntary movement, balance, supports memories, but this dictates where the information goes. So if this is under stress as well, information is going everywhere. I mean, some of you are hyper-organized, I'm sure, and you have a tag and a file for everything. I'm not that guy. I have an assistant that helps me with that for that very reason, because all of my papers tend to be in this big pile. But then all of a sudden, I don't know where I need to put them. And that's essentially what's happening when you are stressed under a cerebellum. So improved cerebellum function equals improved vestibular and fine and gross motor function or better autonomic regulation, which is a fancy way of saying all the autonomic system, all the automatic systems in our body really recentering. So when you see that there's somebody struggling with balance, fine or gross motor of how they move and how they do things, you can trace it right back to that cerebellum. But changes to that cerebral function equal improve prefrontal contour, the prefrontal cortex functions since that cerebellum is the filter. It tells everything where it needs to go. And if that's working well, then the prefrontal cortex where all the decision making is done is in the right place, which then can lead to this idea over time of dysautonomy. And when that state of mind is taking place for the brain for any length of time, whether it's a week, a month, a year, or a lifetime, it leads us to this. You can't be in growth and protection at the same time, as Bruce Lipton said, and I already alluded to earlier. When you're in that state of dysautonomia, the systems no longer are being regulated. Those, all those automatic systems are not being regulated, which leads us to this idea when there is no regulation that dysautonomia is taking place, how the automatic systems, the gas pedal is all the way down, or the gas brake pedal is all the way down. And so we have that ability to not regulate what's going on. Does that make sense? The idea of gas, and, and Megan's right here going, yep, I, I've been living that for 29 years. So you may be living that with your kiddos online, and we know, and I just want you to hear me clear, there is hope. And we want to dig deeper in this so you can get those answers and see that they are in that state of dysautonomia. And when they're in that state for any length of time, those nerves start to wire together. And here's this nerve that has a big part of all of that. The autonomic nervous system has two systems. It has the parasympathetic, which is rest and digest of the brake pedal. And it has the uh, sympathetic nervous system, which is fight or flight, okay, or the gas pedal. Now, controlling all of that is this amazing nerve called the vagus nerve. Vagus means vagabond. And you can see just in this picture here, these are all the systems that it controls. Those are all the systems it controls. It controls for your breathing, your heart rate, it controls your gut, it controls your digestion and filtration. These are all the things you have no control over that you can't just tell your body to do more of. It's automatically doing it. But when it's stressed, they need to stop working the way they need to. There's been a ton of research being done on vagal nerve and sensory processing disorder. And they're trying to figure out a way to jumpstart that vagal nerve to get the body to engage. But when they see that there is an issue with that vagus nerve, where they demonstrate a challenge in that area, it basically has been saying that there's a direct correlation between that and sensory processing disorder. Now I want to take it even deeper because if that's taking place, then we have this big thing that takes place because so many families are with ADHD, ADD, they've got gut issues and they're already gluten-free, sugar-free, red dye free you name it, they're living it out, right? But I want to break down something because you've heard of gut brain, okay? And the gut is its own nervous system, it is, but it is controlled by the central nervous system. And that is controlled by the vagus nerve. So that vagal nerve electrical stimulation can potentially affect intestinal inflammation. So they're doing research right now that if they can stimulate the vagus nerve, it affects how much is happening for uh, intestinal inflammation and getting it back to where it needs to be. So it's actually a brain gut before it's ever gut brain. So if we have, if your kids have trouble processing food, you have gotta get that whole nervous system to go back online and to get back to what a term we call homeostasis or be at rest.
So then we get to the state of dyspinesis. And this is a, and I want to catch this, this is a reversible pathophysiological state. It is both composed of neurophysiological reactions of various agents and repercussions of these throughout our organism. Um, basically, simply tying this together, they're not able to utilize and process energy right. It's inefficient system. If you've ever seen someone do a job with way too many steps, you know, the too many steps, too long, you're like, you didn't really do that. Your kids are trying to lengthen out their bedtime. So brushing teeth becomes a 14 step process instead of something that they can do in five minutes. Um, that's dyspinesis. It's an inordinate amount or a lack of or too much or too little energy being utilized. So when we see that abnormal energy output, that's one of the things we measure here through the insight scan is we look and see where it is. You can see that this is not normal. This is a process of the scan that's taking place over time from 211 all the way to 1216 over a year process. You see here from 18 to 19, this is a, a normal amount, abnormal amount of energy being put out. And that energy starts to change as the adjustments start to take place. But when we see that happening in these kiddos, a lot of times their total energy for a kid that we call a raging bull is so high that it's double or three times that normal. I had a kid the other day who was 450 and normal adult or normal kid is usually between 100 and 115. For him to sit still, it took 400 times more energy. So dyspinesis, abnormal energy output. If you've ever run a sprint over and over again, you know that is abnormal energy output. Okay. <laughs> and you've never sprinted before either, you know it's like that. So, um, which leads to this next D that takes place. And all these Ds play together, but the next one is uh, diastasis. And this is coming from the Greek word meaning shocked throughout. So, if we go back to, or you look at your kid's story or your story, there was a point somewhere where something happened and you were shocked throughout your system. There's a sudden loss or a change of function in a portion of the brain that's connected to a distant but damaged brain area. There's a diastasis. That means there's a disconnect. The site of the originally damaged area of the diastasis are connected to each other by neurons. So these neurons are talking together. And what we see is these nerves that fire together and wire together. But if there's diastasis, they're not connected. So it could be a C-section. It could have been infertility. It could be any of those steps we talked about along the way in that perfect storm that lead to this diastasis. So it's hypothesized here, but this developmental diastasis is basically the hypothesis that in a critical period of development, so when something's happening in an early age of development, that cerebellar dysfunction may disrupt the maturation, that's another fancy word for maturity, of a distant neurocortical circuit. So that's how the brain's talking. So it's the wiring of the brain is now being affected, leading to the ability of cognitive and behavioral symptoms including autism, okay? This is coming from uh, the molecular biology of Princeton University that cerebellum and sensitive periods in autism are trying to track this down. The cerebellum has been studying in relation to motor development. It controls coordination. So if there's been stress or a diastasis has taken place, that system is working overtime. It, and look at this, it strongly suggests that it also influences childhood cognition. So for you, Megan, you knew you struggled to understand how do I put this all together? You were struggling right from the get go and didn't even know it. Stressed and depressed and anxious. <laughs> she just said it so I'll say it again. She said stressed, depressed, and anxious because she was never where she wanted to be. She was always dealing with something and no one would give her any answers. No one would solve the problem. No one would go deeper. I wish I'd been there when you were a kid. Um, because we need to take that stress off that system and get that dice piece. It's reversible. That's the key thing with the dice piece. It's reversible. So nerves that are not talking together can start to talk together and start relieving that stress in that system to get you back where you need to be. It takes time and repetition. So here's what happens on dice pieces. Basically is this, that sensory information getting in is blocked or is challenged in the cerebellum. Then we no longer have a, a place where it's able to translate into thalamus and then it affects that cortex. So we see that the genes and the stress affect the environment. But this is what happens if there's diastasis leads to a distortion of how our brain's working, which leads to disruption of how we're thinking and how things are coordinated, which leads to, if you can't do something as a kid and you can't hold a thought, what do you do? 
you give up, you disconnect, you move away. And then that leads to this repeated, which creates both damage socially in the classroom and the teacher, but it also creates damage to the brain, it creates a pattern that now I'm not gonna try. And every time that fuse, that center gets shorter and shorter. So once we have that diastasis that's taking place, it leads to this idea of dysfunction. So when you start seeing that in childhood, you start seeing that in your early teen years, there was that gut, metabolism starts kicking, immunity. Maybe you got sick a ton as a kid, tonsillitis, strep throat, ear infections, asthma. You were that kid. You were that sick kid all the time. You're like, what's the deal? And so what they do, they gave you a Z-pack. They gave you more antibiotics. They gave you everything. Hopefully you had really, really, really awesome parents. And they gave you some vitamins or some good food as well. Uh, but many times they were just doing what they were told, which then affects the metabolic process of how we process anything. And then we don't know how to filter, which leads to a stressed out system. And that's what we look for in that dysfunction in the glands, organs, and blood vessels is when we do thermal. Thermal measures temperature. Temperature tells us how the system as a whole is doing. This is a system that's working overtime. This is a system at rest. Same system, same person, time and repetition to get that stress to come off that nervous system. The body wants to heal itself. It does. It just can't do with interference. If you've ever tried to take a test with a kid in your ear, or you were you know, eating at a restaurant and that baby was screaming, screaming you know that it led to dysfunction with the meal, right? Um, I apologize if that was your kid or if it was my kid. I'm so sorry about that, okay? But we have, dis dis we have that disconnection that we leads to disorganization and dysregulation. So then we no longer can organize what's happening. And that starts to show up in school, first and foremost. Then it shows up in sports, but it really shows up in social emotional. A lot of times these kids are isolated. It's hard to make friends or they're friends with everybody. And they don't want to do anything else but hang out with friends. My youngest daughter is a perfect storm kid. And she struggles with this immensely because she doesn't like math. She doesn't like to process. She's gone through some trauma when she was younger that's affected her. We naturally induced her and it set her nervous system on fire. She struggled with development. Motor tone was off. She crawled funny. She has a, a dysautonomia. Um, so her eye and just don't exotropia. exotropia. I just complained. Yeah. Um, she has an eye that pulls away neurologically. Um, all because we put this too much stress on our nervous system. I know. Um, so we have a lot of parent guilt sometimes of, of us wanting this baby to come on our time instead of on her time. So we work together all the time to help her reorganize and re-regulate what's going on. And you can see what we're going to measure is when we look at that EMG, which measures the amount of energy or looks for patterns in the system, we start to see how things are organized. And we want things to be smooth and relax. We want to see that energy to come down. Uh, you see this whole site here, the total energy is 135, but over time and repetition, we start to see it at 111. And I'll explain more of this when you come in and get scanned, okay? So subluxation equals disconnection. So stress over time, or stress stuck on equals disconnection. This is Evan before chiropractic care in 2011, okay? Uh, this is taken by my mentor, Tony Ebo, one of his patients, Evan. Uh, he's an amazing kid. Um, he's incredible. Watch this story and then we'll show you what's going on here. You see how his system is stressed. You see the red, blue, and green is essentially a simple way of saying that's where stress points are. Uh, you're going to see his story right here. Bye, Kristen. See you later. Oh, no. Did you have fun? Did you have fun? Yes? Yes? Did you love it, Kristen? Say yes. Yeah. What? Bye, Kristen. Notice how he's checking in and then checking out. He wasn't putting his words together. He's just showing a classic case of that disorganization. He's not able to put things together. He can't talk. He's checking in emotionally. And then he's having this uh, uh, huge behavioral response to a really simple question. Do you like Ann Kristen? Do you have fun at Ann Kristen's? Ah, and then he's, oh, he's out. So you see that. Now, this is him after chiropractic care. Um, this is just incredible. This is a video by his mom. Again, both videos are by his mom.
Okay. See eye contact directly. What's that one? Goody. What is it? Goody. A dog. Yes, yeah. Yeah. A truck. What's that? A truck. A truck. <laughs> What's the truck? That's fast truck. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I love that story. I, I love that that story of Evan because it shows that with time and repetition and helping get that system back aligned, the brain wants to work with the body. The body and the brain perception, it wants to do and coordinate things, but when it can't, it struggles. Uh, when we don't know how to do something, it's very difficult for the body to figure that out. So when things line up again, when everything goes in, if you've ever tried to put a, a nut or a bolt into a hole and it was just a little bit off and you, you could see it was just a little bit off and it, it, it was you could get part of it in, but you couldn't get it to go through. That's essentially what's happening right there. And that perfect storm for a three and under kiddo, which you saw right there with Evan, this is what's taking place in that thermal. Look at how that C1 and C2 right here, that's where that vagus nerve is, was under an immense amount of stress. Look at the whole T12 right here. This is gut regulation endocrine. That's where he's able to process everything. What they didn't tell you is that he was not going poop. He was not pooping. And he was full of it. And if that's over time, it gets toxic on their system. And then all of a sudden, after time of getting them taken care of, they got this whole system to start to wake up and make a huge shift from one side to the other and get a system to come back online and start to calm down. And that's what we're looking for, a shift. I'll tell you this, those of you who are online and for you too, Megan, we're not trying to heal anything. We are here to provide that hope again that your body can do what it's meant to do naturally. It just needs help. Because when something has gone through that diastasis, it's gone through that traumatic piece, it's gone through that stress over time, it affects how the whole system works. And we want to do everything we can to put that system back together and online. Gage, uh, in the exceptional cage, stage is an exceptional program at his elementary school, uh, but had never ever once brought home a completed assignment. Never once had gotten 100% on any test. I mean, literally a smart, smart kid. Test off the charts, high IQ, you know what I mean? Gets, did all this stuff. Uh, underachiever, big time. Not motivated in any shape or form. Came to us before he was officially diagnosed with ADHD. Mom said, hey, we're about to go to a neurologist. I heard that you work with kids and I talked to her about how we help families walking through ADHD, ADD, and sensory issues and autism, how we help their bodies function better. She goes, hey, what do we got to lose? I mean, I love Erin. She's pretty straight up. You know, she's like, what do we got to lose? You know? So it came in and we began taking care of not only engaged, but the whole family. And this was about a month and a half later of coming in three days a week, reset, reset. There are a lot of questions in Aaron's mind. Is this working? What are we doing? I don't know. It sounds funny. It looks funny. Then she walked in with this hanging out. Gage didn't have it. She had it. And Aaron showed that to me and said, hey, this has been an incredible process to watch his brain kick back on because he's never put the effort in to understanding and moving forward. Uh, if I keep talking about it, it'll probably make me cry as well because I love seeing this kid now. He's in junior high and he's bigger and better and smarter than ever and doing good. About to be uh, a new brother here soon as Aaron's going to have a baby. It's going to be exciting. But this is what she wrote down. Uh, this is Gage's story is that everything else is getting better, less stress at school, easier to focus at schools, uh, in a better mood, doing well in school, teachers' concerns and focus and attention, none at all this year. Stress at school is down. I feel more energy. That's from Gage himself. So here's what the scan does. Here's what we're looking for. And we're sensory scans. We're trying to see what was going on. And this was his system. His total system was 193. The total amount of energy, you can see his whole system was on fire. It was working overtime. The amount of energy it took for him to sit still was twice that of normal. And over the time of his care from, from nine to, uh, from September to November, we're able to get his whole system to calm down, quiet down, and went to 123. Got his whole system to get back on track. It was just an incredible process of watching him after time and repetition, getting a system to calm down. Just right now. Jacob's new with us, and I love taking care of Jacob. You just absolutely love Jacob. Interacts with everybody, loves to talk to everybody because school is hard. 
And he won't tell you that, but his mom will. And getting him to focus or finish anything has been a big challenge. And we have the privilege of walking through with him. And getting him here in his scans, you can see his whole system is chronically stuck. His total energy to sit still is 265, almost three times as much. He's stuck right here. He was under what they said with him, what's changed is he's more relaxed when sitting. He did not end up at the doctor for allergies this year. Still struggles a little bit, but did not have to go for a major, a major uh, medical checkup on that. Had better response to change. And here's a big one is more agreeable. So what does that go back to? So we looked at that, what part of the brain is handling all that? It's the amygdala, the hippocampus, they're working together again. They're able to communicate, he's able to process those emotions instead of being overwhelmed. And we're able to keep him from having to go on medication, which is what the mom really wanted more than anything else. It's been a huge privilege to walk through his story. And I can go on and on and on, story after story, there's clear story, there's Cameron's story, there's just so many stories that we've had in our office and adults that have come through, BJ Bowling and, and uh, the, um, um, gosh, um, I just went playing. So I've got one, okay, I've got one, I've got BJ. Uh, but um, we just have these families, even adult males that have come in and said, I wish I'd known you when I was 10. I wish I'd known you when I was here. I wish I'd known you when I failed out of college and had to go do a job that I really didn't want to do. Okay, so here's our action steps for you all, okay? The first thing here, I want you to keep asking questions and finding those answers. And I hope you got some answers to what's going on inside of your brain and how your body works, okay? But the first thing is keep asking questions and finding those answers. The next thing is reduce and remove those three T's. So how do we do that? So you're already doing some of those things. So emotionally, we are living in one of the craziest emotional times ever. I don't know about you, but coming out of the pandemic and a year after, it seems like it's repeated the year before, just different. Uh, it's like, can we just have this, we're having the same year again. And it's really feeling weird. But that's creating an immense amount of stress for us as adults. And that's what it's doing for kids. They just can't verbalize it. They internalize it. So you can reduce and remove those three Ts. Thomas, traumas, thoughts, and, and chemical stress, emotional stress, and physical stress. So you know those things that you can do on that, and I can give you more on that. But the thing that I want you to understand that is when we know where those stressors are, you got to come in and find out what's going on. So come get your child scanned. All those scans that you saw are just this. That's coming, that's the, um, the EMG, that's the HRV, and that is the thermal. So here's what they are. One measures energy, okay? One measures depth of how stuck you are. And the other one measures how the heart responds to and the capacity you have to handle stress. The smaller capacity you have to handle stress, the shorter fuse you have and you snap. The harder the system is working, the less ability it has to do more work. The hotter or cooler system is working, it's forming too hot or too cold, it's not being where it's supposed to. If you've ever gone in a building that's too hot, it's uncomfortable. You don't want to be there. You've been in a building that's too cold as well for any length of time, you don't want to be there. It's that perfect 73 and partly cloudy, like San Diego was every day. Um, okay, inside jokes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was like, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. So here's the action step is that get your child scan, get your scan. So here's some frequently asked questions. How long does it take if someone goes under care? Well, depends. When did those traumas take place? Like we talked about, that was the algorithm we talked about before. So the greater the stress and the earlier it happened and the longer they were under it, the longer it takes to get out of it. But here's the good news. The younger they are, the greater ability they have to heal and relearn. Look at it. Here's the brain's ability to change in response to experience is at its highest here. At two years old, off the charts, something's going on. The amount of effort that such change requires is low, but it does take repetition to get that back in place. Now look what happens as we get older, you start seeing that right at 25 is that sweet spot where it kind of zeroes in right there. Boom, right there is when that ability to change the amount of effort are equal. And then it starts going up the other way again, where the older we get, the amount of effort and the time it takes to change increase dramatically. But I want to clarify this, whatever stressors you've gone through, or whatever stressors your kids have gone through, or what you've gone through in the last two years are all affecting everything. But we know this, that the brain and the body work together. And we want to help get that system unlocked so that you can be at your best. Um, I love this 
chart from the Center for Developing Child. This is a website. Uh, it is developingchild.harvard.edu. So you can see where all this is coming from. Uh, but that just tells us that your ability to change the amount of effort increase the older you get. So when we invest in our kids now, let's let's speak Texas here for a second. Why do you think so many parents invest in sports like crazy in Texas when the kids are young? Because they know that the greater amount of effort they put in, their ability to learn is at their highest. So we're going to put in a lot of effort now so that this is burned to their brain. So someday they're going to go pro and pay for, you know, dad's lifestyle, right? Okay. Uh, or mom's lifestyle. If you're a huge football fan, mom. Okay. Uh, but we've just seen that across the board, but we want to help with that. Okay. So time and frequency matter. Uh, and it usually takes time and frequency because if you got in the gym one day a week, that'd be a lot of good for you, right? No, I've tried that myself. Two days a week helps, but three days a week to five days a week makes big change. And over time, and the more effort you put in, the greater change it takes place. So imagine a kid that's developing, their brain is working, the more effort you put up front, the greater change. Are we a lost cause if we're 29 and above? No, it just takes a little bit longer. Um, it just takes time and repetition investment, but it's a privilege to walk with my older adults who are walking through it because they now are fully aware of what they're walking through. So we want to help you too. Okay, next question. What does that scan measure? Like I said, it measures energy. It's going to measure uh, temperature and it's going to measure depth. So it tells me how much capacity you have to handle stress. It tells me how stressed you are and where. It tells me how much tension is there and also tells me what systems are working well and not well together. And all of this is measuring the nervous system. And if we can measure the nervous system and see if it's functioning well or not, then we know how to take care of the rest of the system. So I just want to say thank you to you right now. Um, I also want to try and get out of the screen share. And let me see if I can pull you guys up here. Yay, Emilio jumped on. All right. Got it. Kept both carries, got Natalie, lost, uh, lost one. So that's pretty good for us. So, um, but I just want to make this offer to you. I want you guys to all know this, okay? So what do we do? I want you to come and get scanned. I want you to get scanned. So if you do nothing else, come get scanned, learn about what's happening for you and your kiddo and your nervous system, okay? Uh, normally that scan is 135, uh, but because you came in tonight and you're here with us, uh, and you guys are online with us, right? Online, you guys are over there, sorry. Online uh, with us, uh, it would be just $65. Now, if you're interested in getting your whole family scan, we have a special that we do. So you'll never pay more than $195 for your whole family to get scanned. So if you have extended family that's in your little world that you want to get scanned to, you're like, you guys have to do this because all of you are ADHD. We got to solve this problem. That's our offer for you tonight. Now, what I ask is that you do that with us tonight, uh, whether that's for the individual uh, or um, for the family, do that with us tonight. So for those of you that are online, I'll just ask that we get like a name and email and we'll kind of work that out uh, tonight or give you a call. We can work that out tonight or first thing tomorrow, but we'd love to get you guys to be a part of that. So and now I'm gonna open up for questions now that I've given you that opportunity. Love for you to take advantage of that. But any questions from Carrie, Carrie, uh, Natalie or Emilio? or Megan, or Corey. Do you have any questions? I don't have any questions, but thank you so much because this explains so, so much to us. Well, Natalie, I'm, I'm glad it helps. Uh, it's just a privilege to take care of your daughters and I can't wait to get uh, take care of her when she gets back in town. And we're still trying to get you guys some great support out there uh, while she's at college. And we're gonna keep diligently finding someone that can keep her on track and adjusted. Um, so we are glad to take care of you and your family. And I'm glad this answers some of those questions for you. Carrie, I saw that you had a question as well. Um, I took myself off mute. I, I guess you're talking to me. Um, I definitely, this was so helpful. I feel very hopeful. And I want to sign at least my son up for a scan, maybe more. Um, so there's the cost of the initial scan. And then what is after that? And is any of it covered by insurance? It is not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, and I'll tell you why. And we get asked that a lot. We don't take insurance. Some insurance does cover it. We don't because we know the care you need and the care they want to get are two different things. And yeah. time and repetition are big for us. Most of our care plans are between two and six months. And some of our extreme cases are nine months that we're working together. Uh, we're seeing you between three and four days a week sometimes. 
um, like I do now for Natalie's daughter, we saw her twice a day for two weeks straight because she was just that stuck. We had a short amount of time. And if your kiddo's in that storm, and that's what we do through the scan. The scan tells me where they are, how stuck they are, and what it's going to be. So it can range between that time frame. But I want to tell you something. I tell this to all my families. We do everything we can to make it as affordable as possible. That's why we do a care plan. We break it down into payments. And we work diligently with you and we will do everything we can to help you get the care that you need, uh, not just what you want or hope for. Okay, thank you. All right, Carrie, so what I think I will do is, I think the best thing to do is we need to get some information from you. Um, I'm gonna have, um, my wife happens to be here tonight, uh, she's covering, and if you can, I don't know if you can chat that to us or we can give you an email or a phone number that we can follow up with you either tomorrow, if that works best. Sure. Can I just send you a Facebook message with my phone number and email? Is that okay? Oh, if you can know how to do that, that'd be wonderful. That'd be great. <laughs> I do. Okay. I'd um, love to tell you that I know how to do that and where that is. So please be patient if I don't find them immediately, but please Emily. send it. Yes, Emily hopefully will. Uh, she will. Okay. Carrie, how about you? Carrie Garcia, any questions or anything we can do for you? No questions. We definitely want to schedule something, though. I just messaged my email address in the chat. Oh, you guys are awesome! And the chat here on the on the message with us. I love to yep. say how to do this. Okay, got it. Perfect. Okay, we'll grab that before we go. Can you grab that screenshot or photo? Of it? Okay. Um, ladies, uh, uh, Emilio, any questions that you have? Is this Emilio or is this uh, uh, another person who stayed acting as Emilio? That's actually my husband. So he's sitting in the car at soccer practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dom, I said hi. Emilio, so glad you're there. Um, Carrie, and Carrie and Natalie and Megan, so glad you guys are part of this tonight. I can't wait to meet you. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to hear that whole story. I want to hear the whole thing. We're going to go back in the birth process, what took place before, during, and while they're going through it, where you're at, what you've tried. Uh, so when we do get you all set up with some paperwork, tell me the whole story. If you want to talk before then, let me know. We can do a whole phone consultation. But this is all we do here, guys, uh, is we take care of kids, moms and dads who are walking through this. We take care of the whole family. Uh, we're absolutely passionate about helping the nervous system function its best. Whether you're brand new, like Emery was when she came in, or you're uh, 29 and holding, uh, like our friend Megan here, yes, or 49 almost, like myself. So thank you so much. Know we love you. Know that you're part of our mission. And if you know of other families that need to be on this call, we do this about once a month. We'll do another one in October. We have wine and wisdom coming up. Emilio, I don't know if you drink brewskis at all, uh, but we're going to be doing a, a dads and drafts up at Tup's. Uh, so we're gonna have a fun time just to get out there and hang out with some dads and have some fun uh, together. So uh, if there's any other questions, please hit me up. Uh, I'm a phone call away. If you want to write down our office number, let me give it to you so you can just call us. I know it's in our information, but if you have a question tomorrow about anything, it's 972. Um, actually, we could just put it in the chat, I think. We'll try. Can you type that in there? No, this chat's funny. Okay, we won't do that. Uh, 972. Uh, 810-3930 is our office number. But ladies, thank you so much. Any other questions before we go? I keep looking at the screen like you guys are going to talk to me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right, ladies. Thank you so much. We're going to end the recording. Uh, can't wait to see you, Carrie, Carrie, uh, Natalie, and Megan. And then Emilio, do you did you want us to follow up with you in any way? Oh, I'm sorry, Emilio's connected to Carrie. Yeah. Got it. All right, sorry. Um, um, yeah, sorry. that's my wife. I'm connected to her. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for helping me out, brother. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Well, I enjoyed it. I hope this was informational for you guys. It gave you some hope, gave you some help and some answers. And we can't wait to take care of your families and help you guys move forward and do that naturally. We know we'll be praying for you guys, but thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Please tell other moms and dads that are about it, and we'll be doing this again soon. Thank you so much. You're welcome so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Megan, do you have any questions? Yeah, now you get us all to yourself. I don't think so, not yet. It was a lot of information. Can we go over it again? Just an advantage of that. You know, with you in this, the whole process for you is, you know, I just saw you nodding your head a lot. And that's, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. 
if we were to work together over the next four to six months, what would you want to see happen for you? I, mean, I know you've just recently diagnosed, just started taking some meds for the first time. How are you doing? Uh, not very. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm just kidding. I, like, I've actually been to a chiropractor since I was like 12 or 13. Awesome. And in high school, I usually went three times a week because scoliosis. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you're going for scoliosis? Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, never thought to. No, it wasn't like that wasn't on the. And a lot of people don't realize, like, I had ADHD. And it's just one, my little brother's like hella autistic. Not hella, I shouldn't say that. But he's on the spectrum. It was like very turmoil. For a long time. Yeah, they didn't want to recognize it or uh, no, my parents tried, but they couldn't find doctors that understood. He didn't get diagnosed until he was like 12 or 13. Okay. So I was kind of like lower on their radar, which not no hate towards that, but no. So just a little. I think I probably <laughs> had I probably had symptoms and things that should have been obvious, but it just wasn't, I guess. So yeah, with the chiropractor, it was mostly just my back hair. I was in dance. I couldn't breathe when I went one way versus the other. <laughs> but the whole connections and like trying to think of something that would make me that's always been a big deal for me and always feel like I'm dumb. <laughs> but the whole like get over it and mm -hmm. try harder thing that was always not from my parents at all, just yeah. like from usually boyfriends, but <laughs> but yeah. So then you hear that connections is always me. 